let me start with the presentation and i'll this session will be recorded so others can watch the recording so in this session we will be discussing few previous session doubts and then i will be moving to the week 3 topics and we'll be practicing few mcqs so in week 3 you have read about the genome analysis part 2 and methods for the dna rna sequencing along with sequence analysis and their applications so in the previous session uh, few people have doubts regarding what is alternative splicing and how it generates the diversity at the level of transcripts and then further it moves to the isoform level diversity so it is just a representation of alternative splicing it is a cellular process in which exons from the same gene are joined in different combinations which leads to different but related mrna transcripts and these mrnas can be translated to pr produce different proteins with distinct structures and functions all from a single gene so with the help of this alternative splicing the single gene can code for multiple proteins so here in the right side i have shown in the figure that how different types of alternative splicing which are possible and how they generate different isoforms so in the first you can see it is a constitutive so constitutive means it is a normal splicing in which all the exons are retained in the mature mrna whereas in alternative splicing what happens is different exons are recombining in different combinations so here in cassette exon you can see that one exon is skipped in the second isoform so one uh, one isoform have all the three exons whereas in second there is only two exons so this event is known as exon skipping event in which exon is skipped in one of the mrna then alternative 5 prime splice site it means uh, the splice sites are present on the intronic sequences and spliceosome recognize those splice sites and cut those introns and then rejoins the exons so what happen in certain cases that exons um, so the introns uh, spliceosomes are not able to recognize that site on the intron due to which the splice site which is present at the 5 prime end is modified now so in this you can see that there is a second intron for which this site is modified its 5 prime site is modified in such a way that now in the one uh, isoform which is generated it contains all the three forms means all the three exons but in the second you can see the modified exon number 2 due to the uh, changes in the 5 prime splice site of intron 2 and spliceosome has not was not able to recognize it correctly so due to which it has chopped off half of the exon 2 as well similarly in alternative 3 prime splice site similar thing happens with the 3 prime splice site of the intron so in this also intron 2 the 3 prime splice site is changed in such a way that exon 3 is chopped off so these issues happen due to the spliceosomal machinery means due to spliceosomal machinery uh, not proper recognizing the uh, splice sites at the introns but it leads to the functional diversity or protein diversity you can say so that's why it's helping to generate the various proteins out of single genes then comes intron retention so in um, previous week to uh, assignment i think you had a question related to this that alternative splicing could lead to the exogenization of this intron so that was still a doubtful question which i feel because intron is not exactly converting to exon but still it is retained so it depends that how you define the exons so in this case you can see that the intron 2 is being retained in one of the isoform whereas in isoform 2 it is not retained it is it's a normal isoform which is expressed then comes mutually exclusive exons so it is a type of alternative splicing in which what happens is two exons are mutually exclusive they will never come together in any of the isoform which will be generated so that's why it is referred to as mutually exclusive then comes alternative promoters and alternative polyadenylation it means that uh, in this the there are choices of different promoters which are being used due to which the product can change because uh, any one of the exon could be now selected to start the translation so this can also alter the product protein product which is now formed whereas in alternative polyadenylation also there are poly a signals at the end so it depends that at what side those poly a signals are present it leads to the termination of the protein earlier or later so alternative choice of poly a signal is also used here which leads to the diversity at the level of isoform so in this way alternative splicing generates the diversity at the level of isoforms so in this whenever the intron is retained so what happens when exon is retained then it always leads to the functional protein but if intron is retained then it can have different consequences 
for example it can lead to non sense mediated decay in which due to certain uh, modifications uh, such as it can generate the stop codon it changes the frame in such a way that it generates now stop codon due to which the protein will be uh, decayed it will undergo non sense mediated decay it uh, because it will not properly fold as well and then it can also uh, leads to the premature termination of the protein as well then comes the cases where it could be detained in the nucleus it is not able to move out and then there could be the cases where it is stored in the cytoplasm that particular mrna which is now containing this intron and then the cases where it is also possible that that intron can bring some new domain so due to which one of the isoform which contains that intron has the extra domain so it is not always the case that it is having negative impact in certain cases it could have the positive impact also on the protein isoform as well then there was another doubt in which you asked that how the exons were means from two different genes what if exons combine together so that is a well known uh, observation that it is a there is a process named as exon shuffling it is a mechanism for the formation of new genes so what happens here is that uh, two or more exons from different genes they can be brought together ectopically or uh, the same exon can be duplicated to create a new exon intron structure so in, this can happen due to transposon mediated exon shuffling or crossover during the sexual recombination of parent genomes or illegitimate recombinations so these all are the causes of this exon shuffling in which the exons from two different genes can combine and then generate some new gene so here you can see this is gene 1 and gene 2 and now they are the regions of similarity of crossover and then they are recombining in such a way that new gene is now generated so certain exons in this gene are coming from gene 2 and some are coming from gene 1 so in this way it is also now uh, forming new protein and you can see here that it is having one extra domain i mean uh, with respect to protein 2 it has one extra domain that is coming from this protein 1 and exon 2 is contributing to that domain so in this way with the help of unequal crossing over or transpositions the exon shuffling can happen which can lead to further diversity at the level of proteins which could be helpful or in certain cases it could have negative impact as well so in this um, in the previous session one person have also asked the doubt regarding the how can we amplify the unknown dna sequence using the pcr so this question was also in your week 2 assignment and it's so in that it was written that um, piece, uh, so in that you had to choose some incorrect option so in that incorrect option was that uh, you could not amplify the uh, target gene which for which you do not have the dna sequence so sometimes what happens is that uh, the lines the words which are written in the question they matters a lot so in that it was asked that you have you want to amplify the target gene for which the dna sequence is not known so specifically amplifying a gene without the uh, knowledge of the dna sequence is difficult task but it is not impossible but for that that option was incorrect as compared to the other options because they were correct as compared to that due to which that option was the one which is incorrect so what happens in the case of unknown dna sequences the primers which we design are known as the degenerate primers which contain the mixtures of similar oligonucleotides that are used in the pcr so now we do not know the dna sequence so what we can do here is that we can perform some alignments with the orthologous genes and uh, after drawing the um, means orthologous gene comparisons Uh, so these comparisons are drawn for the particular unknown dna sequence with the orthologs and then we identify that uh, okay so if those two uh, organisms are sharing some kind of similarity so it means that the genes could also have sequence similarity among them so there is a video uh, youtube link which i have provided here you can go through this video in which he has clearly explained that how to generate degenerate primers and how they help to amplify the unknown sequence step wise let what are the procedures for that uh, for example if you have unknown sequence then how you can go for the phylogenetic analysis and the orthologous orthologous gene comparisons uh, when you do not have the genome level information but there is some kind of other information which you have related to proteins or other things due to which you can uh, design this um, orthologous you can identify the orthologous genes so 
in this i have uh, given that how degenerate primers are designed for example in the bottom table you can see there is a amino acid sequence which is uh, vldwf so for this uh, in the left hand side the primer is being given so how this primer sequence is designed for this so the table above here shows that what are the codons that codes for these particular amino acids so sometimes more than one codon can code for a single amino acid in that case now if even if we know the protein sequence but we are not sure that what are, what could be the possible nucleotide sequence which is responsible for that particular amino acid so in that case to design the primer becomes a bit uh, difficult so in that case this v is particularly coded by this um, these codons these set of codons which has gt is fixed but the third position is changing so this third position it could be either t c or a or g so for this in order to design the primer we will see that if all of these nucleotides are changing so what could be the code that will be given to the primer it means that we will be using different combination of primers but the backbone sequence will be fixed so these uh, codes are generally used to tell the background sequence that is fixed so in this case n means a c g t means any one of these could be present so due to which in this primer sequence it is written as gtn so n means that it could be a t c g so in this way different uh, means different primer combinations are possible so it tells about the reference primer which is mainly used which is fixed so in this way uh, we can use these degenerate primers to amplify the unknown gene because we do not know is uh, know its gene sequence so in this way different primers we have to design and then we can amplify but then it depends at whether it will be um, specifically it will amplify the gene at the same level if as compared to the cases where we have the tra target information along with us but yeah still we can go for this um, amplification even if sequence is unknown so now before moving to the practice questions let me quickly check that how many people have joined okay so there are few people have joined so yeah if you want to answer you can answer and you can also ask your doubts in the chat if you do not want to unmute and say and when means if you feel like i have to go through certain content again then you can let me know because if means if i'm running a bit fast then you can let me know so now let's start with this practice question so shown here is a schematic of the image for the dna sequencing gel using the sanger method based on your understanding of the methodology identify the option that shows the dna sequence of the template strand so one thing i want to mention here that whenever you read the question so you always should focus on the words which it says so in this they are asking you to tell the dna sequence of the template strand so these are the options and this is the gel which is being run so now you have to tell the sequence of the template strand so you can if you want to answer you can answer i'll wait for 2 3 seconds and then i'll give the answer anybody wants to answer okay so now let's see that what could be the possible possible answer so the correct option is this option number 2 so now how why it is correct so firstly whenever you see the gel then firstly it runs from the negative end to the positive so dna always moves from negative towards positive and why is it so because dna is a charged molecule due to the um, means phosphate group that is present in it it provides negative charge to the dna so dna always moves from the negative terminal towards the positive so in this way the directionality which means we will be reading the strand will be in this way so negative will be the 3 prime strand and positive will be the 5 prime strand and dna is running uh, means it's running from the 5 prime to 3 prime so it means that 5 prime strand will be the forward means forward band will be of 5 prime and the end it will be 3 prime end so if we look at this gel so we can see that at the 3 prime end there is c then t and similarly it will be the sequence for the uh, means the DNA which is run through this gel. So now they are asking you the template strand. So template strand will be the strand which is complementary to this strand. So with the help of this, we will be uh, designing the complementary strand to this, which will give us the template strand. 
and then this the order of template strand should be five prime to three prime so these things also you should uh, you should watch that what directionality they have given so in this way we will be designing the complementary to this so the complementary sequence to this will be this and for three prime the complementary strand will have five prime and similarly at the five prime and in the bottom the complementary strand will have three prime and so now this will be the complementary to this and it is the dna template similarly the sequence here is also from five prime to three prime so you can simply write this sequence here and in certain uh, cases you can see that even if you identify the uh, first two three nucleotides correctly you can easily answer this question you don't have to uh, look the entire gel because here you can see that even if you get the information of the first two nucleotides correctly then you can answer this question very easily so now let's yeah Yeah. Okay, so if uh, I don't include template, then what you are asking that? Okay, so number one. Okay, so the strand which is run, so for that the option A won't be correct because it is running from the you have to tell it from 5 prime to 3 prime direction so the gcaa third option yeah three hmm. yeah okay so now let's move to the second question so in this the question says in chromatin immunoprecipitation that is known as chip assay the protein dna complex is pulled primarily using so these are the options antibody glass beads special affinity column and cross linker so i hope you have covered this in your week 3 lectures so it's quite easy you can answer this question in the chat if you don't want to unmute and say anyone yeah what about the other people so Okay, so the correct answer is the antibody and it is self-explanatory that specific antibodies are used to pull the DNA protein complex. So now let's look at the what is chip assay. So generally it is used to identify the DNA protein bindings. So in this, firstly you cross-link the DNA and protein, then cell lysis is performed and then various sonications or enzyme digestions are performed. So at last you obtain the fragmented chromatin. Now that fragmented chromatin which you obtain, you perform the immunoprecipitation with specific antibodies. So now this immune precipitate will be formed. Immune precipitate here means immune refers to the antibody and precipitate means now the DNA and protein that are bound together. So they along with the antibody will form the immune precipitate. Now you will purify the DNA and you can perform PCR, qPCR, microarray or sequencing depending on the analysis of the bound DNA that is bound to that particular antibody. So in this way, the chipsec will help you. And then here I have shown that uh, what is used generally for cross-linking. So there are two kinds of proteins, uh, protein DNA interactions, which you can identify using the chip assay. So firstly, if you want to identify the transcription factor binding. So in certain cases, you have some transcription factors and you want to know whether they bind to which means to which side of the DNA they bind or to which gene they are bind and which region of the DNA they bind. So for those cases, for cross-linking, you use the formaldehyde, whereas there are another DNA protein complexes which are known as histones. Uh, so in the nucleosomes, the chromatin is wrapped around histones. So for uh, looking at those interactions to identify that whether there are histone modifications or what are the reasons. So for that, for cross-linking, you do not use the formaldehyde. It is already cross-linked, as you know. Then for fragmentation, in case of uh, transcription factor binding, you use sonication, whereas in the case of histone-bound uh, DNAs, you use MNAs treatment. And then comes immunoprecipitation, in which you use the antibodies. So in transcription factor, you will be using the antibodies which are specific to that protein of interest, whereas in the case of uh, understanding the histone modifications, you will use the antibodies which are specific for those histone modifications. 
So in this way, you can perform this step assay for different kinds of DNA protein interactions. And these were the things. Now let's move to the question number three. So which one of the following options correctly identifies the potential of the popular bioinformatics tool that is the multiple sequence alignment also referred to as MSA. So option one is it can identify the sites for creating genetically modified model organisms. Option two is it helps to identify amplified regions in the genome. Option three is it can infer homology and the evolutionary relationships between the aligned sequences and option four is all of these. So you know that MSC is quite popular. So which of these things it can do? What do you think? Okay, so next. Number three. It can infer homology and the evolutionary relationships between the line sequences. Okay, so yeah, it is the correct option. So firstly, let's see option number one. It is saying it can identify the sites for creating genetically modified model organisms. So it's completely wrong. It has nothing to do with the uh, identifying certain sites because it is not identification method. Then comes, it helps to identify amplified regions in the genome. Similarly, this is also not correct. Yeah, so the correct option is option number three. So now let's see what is multiple sequence alignment. So when we say multiple sequence alignment, there is another term which exists that is known as pairwise sequence alignment. So pairwise means when you are dealing with the two sequences, but then comes multiple sequence alignment in which you are dealing with two or more, means more than two. So three or more biological sequences, they can either be protein sequences or nucleic acid sequences of similar length. And similar length here means that it's not fixed that they should have identical length. They could vary to some level, but yeah, they should be of nearly similar length. And from the output, homology can be inferred and the evolutionary information you can uh, look from there. So here is one of the example in which I have given you the three different kind of RAS proteins that exist in humans. And these are the proteins uh, which has certain mutations and then they lead to certain kinds of cancers. So researchers use this MSA to identify the regions that are more conserved, which regions are varying and means the reasons, uh, regions which are more conserved, those are the regions that codes for certain domains or uh, those regions are important for some functional activity of that particular protein. So in that way, those things we can understand by performing this multiple sequence alignment. So now here you are seeing this is the uh, sequence alignment in bottom of the each alignment, you see there are stars or some columns or some periods are shown here. So what does it mean? In certain cases, there are uh, empty spaces as well. So these means what kind of uh, means conservation that you see. So for star, it means conserved sequence. That means all the amino acids present in all these proteins are identical. So if they are identical, it means it is a conserved sequence. Then the colon, it represents the conservation, conservative mutation. It means that now amino acid, amino acid has changed to some other amino acid, but still they shares some kind of biochemical similarity due to which it is not having any impact on the protein as of now. It is not impacting its function to a greater extent. Then comes semi-conservative mutations. So these are the mutations in which what happens is that now the amino acid has changed, but uh, there are certain things that can change. It can have some different structure, although the functions, they could be same of those two amino acids, but they have major structural differences among them. So one is having some extra uh, aliphatic group or some I mean, aromatic chain is now present. So these things in those cases, it could be the semi-conservative mutation in which the biochemical properties are similar to some extent, but the size is varying a lot or it can be other way around as well. Then comes non-conservative mutations. So non-conservative mutations are the mutations in which the amino acid that is now um, substituted the one of the protein as the one which is entirely different. For example, if uh, there was some positively charged amino acid present in two of the proteins, so now in third protein, there is negatively charged amino acid, or there is some smaller amino acid such as glycine. So it has a huge impact on the structure function of that particular protein. So those mutations are known conservative mutations. And then there are certain gaps. For example, if the length of particular uh, protein which you are considering is different or there are certain cases. So in those cases, in those places, you place a gap in one of the, or in, means more than two as well. It depends that 
where the extra amino acid is present. So in others, for the compensation, you use the gap. So first, uh, so now let's see. In this, I have in detail I've explained what the conservative substitution means, what semi-conservative substitution means, and what non-conservative. And here are the examples. For example, serine is converting to threonine, so it is example of conservative substitution. When leucine is changing to isoleucine, iso so it is also a conservative substitution. Then what is semi-conservative is that glutamic acid is converting to aspartic acid. So although they both are the charged amino acids, but still there is a difference of uh, one carbon means one uh, group which is present means on the length of both of these amino acids varies. Whereas the non-conservative substitution means serine is now replaced by phenylalanine. So phenylalanine has this aromatic ring whereas serine is very small. So now the, there will be major impacts on the protein structure if this substitution happens. So in this, I have given you the examples of all, means I have given you the structures of all the 20 amino acids. They are one letter code and three letter code. And uh, I have also means categorized them on the basis of the biochemical properties. So in the first, you can see these are the positively charged amino acids. They are arginine, histidine, and lysine. So these can replace one another. These will come under this uh, conservative or semi-conservative category, depending on that which amino acid is being replaced. It should not have major structural uh, implications or structural changes among the two proteins. So in that case, it will be conservative or either semi-conservative. Then comes negatively charged, that is aspartic acid and glutamic acid. So whenever they replace each other, it will be a conservative mutation and then polar uncharged which includes the serine, threonine, asparagine and glutamine and then there are special classes of amino acids which are very small and they have many roles in the protein in defining the protein structures such as glycine, proline and cysteine. So cysteine and methionine are the two amino acids which contain the sulfur group and they form the disulfide bonds and there is one additional amino acid which is not generally observed which is the selenocysteine which has selenium in place of this um, sulfur group. And it is the special case. It is not mainly observed in the proteins. Then comes the hydrophobic amino acids that are alanine, valine, isoleucine, leucine, methionine. So they all can replace one another and it, is, it will be a conservative or semi-conservative uh, substitution depending on that, what is the difference in their structure or size. Then are the hydrophobic uh, amino acids which are phenylalanine, tyrosine and tryptophan they all have aromatic rings so they can replace one another then here i have given the table because in just in case you want to identify that whether this particular substitution will be conservative or not so this table gives you the information of all the conservative substitutions that are possible but among them you will find in certain cases that certain conservative mutations are now uh, in the alignment you see them as a semi conservative so this is under I means this could this is subject to change depending on that what uh, impact it have on the protein structure now so with that it can vary in certain cases the conservative mutation can become semi-conservative depending on the difference in the protein functionality or at the level of protein structure what it brings so in this yeah Okay, so in this proline and glutamic acid. Yeah, so, but, so what happens in certain, this table I'm, I was saying that only. So what happens in certain cases, there are certain groups that are very important to perform certain kind of uh, biochemical activity, certain binding. So in, But if you see the groups that are present in both of them, so in certain cases, these groups can act as a compensatory. Yeah, so, 
yeah in this table they have specifically mentioned it that there are certain cases which do not lie in the same biochemical category but these are drawn from the studies means when different proteins were analyzed so conservative here means that even if that uh, amino acid is changed by certain other amino acid so there is no effect on its functionality or structure so on the basis of that they have designed this table but yeah you can see certain cases here where the two amino acids are completely having different biochemical functions yeah so in this example which i was talking earlier hras nras and kras so in this you can see that uh, whenever the amino acids are same so star is drawn whereas if d and e is there so d and e means aspartic acid and glutamic acid can also be called as aspartate or glutamate so whenever they replace one another it is a conservative mutation conservative substitution then comes serine thrombin case it is also conservative then the next one is of rnk that's arginine and lysine so it is also the case of the means conservative substitution then all such cases are conservative and then in this they have mentioned s and n which means the serine and then asparagine so in this case you can see they have mentioned it as the semi conservative but they lie in the similar polar uncharged molecules they are polar uncharged but why it is uh, referred to as semi conservative here so it depends on the size so they are varying means there is difference in the size among both of them one is having the amino group additional amino group and then one additional uh, carbon molecule is also present in asparagine which is not present in the serine due to which it is now here it is acting as a semi conservative substitution so these all definitions depends upon their uh, what effect they have on the function of the protein so there are certain matrices spam matrices and blossom matrices which decides that uh, if particular amino acid is replaced by some other amino acid so what is the effect of that particular substitution is having on the protein so in that they have studied multiple proteins and they have drawn the comparisons and then they have identified that I means this type of substitution or mutation is either conservative or semi conservative or non conservative so in this way it can change so now let's look uh, at this ras as i was talking earlier so in, it accounts for 20 to 30% of the human cancers that's why it's very important to study this gene and it has three uh, there are three types of ras genes which one is kras nras and hras so kras is observed in the colorectal cancer so there is mutation in this gene which is observed in the colorectal cancer then in uh, it is also seen in the case of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma which is very lethal so that's why to identify the places where that mutation is coming and now it is causing the cancer so it's very important to deal with with that mutation so that's why these multiple sequence assignments can help us with that similarly nras and hras are also involved their mutations are also involved in some other types of cancers so what they have done here they have used the clusel omega which is a tool for multiple sequence alignment they have performed multiple sequence alignment of all those sequences and then the region which are showing complete conservation means all the amino acids are identical in this region so it is termed as 100% identical or conserved region whereas there are certain regions that is showing uh, means huge variation so in this particular region you can see there are many known conservative substitutions are present and then there are very few uh, semi conservative and conservative but majorly from by looking at the entire three means entire msa you can see this region is the region which is majorly varying among them so this is known as hyper variable region among all these root uh, all those genes so these are the regions which uh, is responsible for the difference in their functionality but the conserved region it it means that if it is conserved in all of these genes it means it has some role to play at, at the level of function that is conserved among all of these genes so when the biopsy samples were collected and the means in biopsy samples after getting them the uh, that is uh, means we observe that what are the genes what are the sequences of those genes so when mutations were observed so it was found that the mutations were mainly present at the glycine at the position number 12 which is present here then at glycine at the position number 13 and the glutamine at the position 61 so whenever these mutations means mutation at these positions occur so then they reach to the cancer and these mutations are occurring in these regions 
are the conserved regions which means that this particular region has some very important role to play for the functionality of this ras protein and whenever there is some mutation so now this region is disturbed and it will have some kind of means negative implication negative impact on the person so it leads to cancer so in this way msc can help you to know the regions that are most important for the functionality of particular gene so in this way multiple sequencing is multiple sequence alignment is helping you now let's move to the next question so it says array based comparative genomic hybridization also known as array cgh is a popular method for analyzing whole genome content which one of the following cannot be detected using the array cgh so option 1 is balanced chromosomal translocations option 2 is copy number variations option 3 is copy number amplifications and option 4 is all of these so array based comparative genomic hybridization so it's it gives you some hint from its name only comparative genomic hybridization okay so let's see what is the correct answer somebody wants to say option one yeah right so the correct option is balanced chromosomal translocations so in this Uh, array based it as its name suggests it is the comparative genomic hybridization so it identify the quantitative difference in the genome such as copy number variations deletions or amplifications and it do not have anything to do with the variance translocations so it cannot be done with the help of this and now this array based cgh it is also referred to as micro array based comparative genomic hybridization it's the short form and also called as matrix cgh or array cgh or a cgh these are different alternative names for the same technique so it is a cytogenetic technique for the detection of chromosomal copy number variations on the genome and it compares the patient genome and against the reference genome so in this uh, left side shows the tumoral dna that is labeled with the cyano5 and in the right side there is the another reference set which is representing the normal dna which is labeled with some other uh, means chrome dye and another dye different dye so now these both are combined in the equal amounts uh, of the dna and now this is the chip which uh, so it shows there are probes and there will be hybridization now this if you supply this uh, both the reference and test set so if there will be hybridization it means that the particular probes were present on this microarray so now if you see the lack of tumoral dna deletions and excess of tumoral dna amplifications so you can analyze this and you can identify that what sample is mainly present in but uh, expression is majorly observed which kind of dna sample is over expressed which has the greater expression which gene is expressing at the greater level so all those things you can capture by using the array comparative genomic hybridization and you can draw you can draw comparisons between the normal versus the Uh, patients okay so now let's move to the next question shown here is a schematic of an array of an assay used for the genomic approaches which one of the following uh, which one of the options correctly identifies the method that that the schematic represent and its objective so this is the schematic you have to see this what does it represents option 1 says fluorescence in situ hybridization that is involved in localization of genes on the chromosomes option 2 is western blotting protein estimation and option 3 is chromatin immunoprecipitation for chromatin dynamics option 4 is in vitro dna synthesis that is involved in dna amplification so means this schematic is quite easy it is also means we also have seen it earlier Hmm. Yeah. So somebody also have marked option three in the chat. So yeah. So the correct option is chromatin immunoprecipitation, and it's self-explanatory, which used to study the chromatin dynamics. It tells you what kind of binding. So that thing we already have discussed. So let's move to the next question. Which one of the following options is not an essential prerequisite? for the shotgun sequencing approach 
So option one is DNA polymerase. Option two is host vector. Option three is information on the position of DNA fragment in the genome. And option four is DNA library. So what do you think which is not an important prerequisite? So sometimes what happens is that you observe, you read certain options and you see that uh, each and every option seems correct. So in that case, you have to select the option which is lesser accurate as compared to the other one, which is not the that much essential. So in that in this question, you can see that. So what do you think? What could be the correct answer for this question? Okay. So let's see. So yeah, the correct option is option number three, which is the information on the position of the DNA fragment in the genome. And it is self-explanatory for the short gun sequencing. You do not need to know the information about the position of the DNA fragments in the genome. It is simply sequencing the part of the gene. So what is the short gun sequencing? In this I have explained. So it is a laboratory technique for determining the DNA sequence irrespective of its position of an organism's genome. And the method involves randomly breaking up the genome into smaller DNA fragments that are sequenced individually and then it requires the computer program to look for the overlaps so that we can assemble those small reads. And now after assembly, we can get an entire DNA sequence for the genome. So in this way, in short gun sequencing, it means you are breaking down this bigger sequence and smaller fragments. So that is the main principle of this short gun sequencing. And after assembly will be performed. So in this, I have shown you the essential prerequisites that are required for short gun sequencing. So firstly, you need the high quality genomic DNA, which is the starting material for the sequencing. Then you need DNA fragmentation reagents. So fra fragmenting the DNA into smaller fragments, you require the enzymes which will break this DNA. Then you need library preparation kits. So these kits will contain certain adapters, primers for amplifying that, enzymes for the library construction. Then comes DNA size selection reagents, which will select the size of the fragments. Then comes DNA quantification reagents that are generally used to quantify the DNA concentration and assessing the quality. Then comes DNA polymerases that are involved in the DNA amplification when you are preparing the library. And then comes DNA library itself, which contains the fragments which are now ready for the sequencing. And then host vector if applicable. So in the question, uh, if you see the vector means this clonal amplification step. So it is means it depends. You can either go for the step or you can also skip this step. It is not one of the means essential step. So now let's move to question number seven. So it's, uh, it says shown here is a schematic of an assay platform used for genomic approaches. Which one of the options correctly identifies the assay depicted and the property of the probe indicated? So in this, they have already provided you hint that it is a FE matrix chip and these are the probes. So now you have to tell which is the assay means which option is correct among them. Option A is option one is RNA chip and the, this particular probe is peptide. Then RNA chip probe is mRNA, gene chip oligonucleotide and then gene chip fluorescently labeled DNA. Okay. Good to hear that somebody has answered. Okay, so option three is correct. And this FE matrix chip is a gene chip and these probes are the oligonucleotides. And these probes are oligonucleotides that are complementary to the mRNA sequences or the target DNA. So however, they are not fluorescently tagged in this case in the gene chip. So now let's see here. So what uh, is there in the FE matrix chip? So in the central, the central square which you see if we expand it, then we can see there are million of different features that is present. So these probes are attached to this particular chip. And now if you will provide your sample and then there will be hybridization. So with that, you can observe the expression of the genes. So this particular uh, FE metric gene chips are the microarray platforms which are generally designed to identify or to profile the gene expression and to identify genotypes and there are various genomic analysis that you can perform. And at the same time, it can tell you the expression levels of thousands of gene genes. It is not limited to single gene. There could be thousands of genes which you can detect. And you can also detect genetic variations in the sample. 
so so these use the oligonucleotide probes it is not uh, means fixed that dna probes will only be used or the rna probes it is oligonucleotide probes so it depends what kind of sample is there what kind of hybridization you want to perform so in that way you can change the probe which is being used specific probes can be designed so in this way it is all about the gene chip now let's move to the next question so the next question says based on your understanding of gene sequencing technologies identify the type of gene sequencing given here in the schematic so now you have to tell which type of gene sequencing technique is this option 1 says spiro sequencing option 2 says tanger sequencing option 3 is illumina sequencing and option 4 is none of these so what do you think which type of gene sequencing technique is this so uh, somebody has written i have a confusion confusion in this so you have a confusion in this question or the previous question okay you can type in the chat and i'll see okay so somebody means many people are saying option 1 so yeah it is the correct it is the uh, schematic of the pyro sequencing so now let's see what is pyro sequencing so it is simply the dna sequencing method in which you determine the order of nucleotides in the dna it is also known as sequencing by synthesis it is based on sequencing by synthesis method in which you synthesize the complementary strand and then you get to know the sequence so in which uh, okay so now let's move to the complete means clearer picture of the pyro sequencing so what happens in this it relies on the detection of pyrophosphate that is being released and then ge generation of the light on the nucleotide incorporation rather than chain determination so chain uh, chain termination sorry so chain termination with the di deoxynucleotides that was used in the sanger sequencing method so instead of that in this what they use the release of pyrophosphate which will further generate the light so due to which it has got its name pyro sequencing as there is release of pyrophosphates and then it can help you to detect the snps insertion deletions gene copy numbers and dna methylations so these things can be um, these are the applications of this pyro sequencing and it has potential advantages of accuracy flexibility parallel processing and can be easily automated as compared to the older techniques of uh, sequencing and this technique also avoids the need for the labeled primers and labeled nucleotides you do not have to label the nucleotide as it is producing light with the release of pyrophosphate so labeling is not required that's why this method is helpful so here you can see this is the dna polymerase and this is the complementary strand that is being synthesized so it is working on the principle of uh, synthesis sequencing by synthesis so in this Uh, whenever a nucleotide that is complementary to this particular template strand comes and binds then it will reduce the pyrophosphate which will further with the help of uh, sulfurylase and luciferase it will generate the light so with that with the intensity of light you can detect the sequence of the uh, nucleotides that are present in the sequence that you have okay sorry so now let's move to the next question for that let me check so can the probe used for the gene chip taken as single stranded in nature what is the process of target and probe binding and disease detection using gene chip so firstly we are saying that we are using this gene chip there is a kind of hybridization that will occur so obviously the strand which we are using it will be mostly single stranded only because uh, generation of triple strand is means hybridizing to the double stranded dna is difficult so mostly these gene chips contain the single they these are single stranded in nature but in certain cases they could be double stranded as well so then there will be the hybridization to the of means there will there will be the formation of triple strands but yeah, it is easier to see double strand as compared to the triple strands what is the process of target and probe binding and disease detection is in gene chip so in gene chip the probe probes that you design they are very specific they will only bind to the complementary sequence so this hybridization process it completely depends on the reverse complementarity so if that particular complementary sequence will be present in your sample then only binding will happen and if more that means if in your sample more amount of that particular sequence is present so more binding will happen which will give you more signal so in the case of disease detection if you observe certain sequence 
in in greater number of times the more signal which you will see in that particular gene chip it will tell you that this gene is now over expressing this gene is over expressed due to which you can detect the disease because you know the um, sequence that is responsible for the disease so you can design that probe which will bind to that particular sequence now if you will provide the sample and the hybridization is observed it means that particular gene is present in that sample and it means it is means causing the disease in certain cases what happens is the not just uh, human genes but some other microbes they are causing certain disease to identify those microbes also the sample in the sample the microbe genes could also be present so for that we can use this in those disease identification as well so these uh, all the design this probe design they can they're syn synthetically produced and those sequences are synthetically produced in the lab then they are stuck to the uh, particular dna chip and then particular means specific dna chip will be designed each time the gene chip can be customized means you it depends on you what kind of probe sequence you want to attach to it so in that way it helps you in the detection of the disease so i hope if you have still you have doubt then you can ask so now let's move to this question question number 9 so which one of the following options is incorrect with regard to the difference between the sanger sequencing method from the next generation sequencing method so option 1 says sanger sequencing is the targeted to a segment of dna template while ngs could sequence the whole genome uh, whole dna template so next option is ngs method can sequence hundreds to thousands of genes or gene regions simultaneously while the sanger method could sequence only a part of a gene per run option 3 is sanger method is not scalable while the ngs method is scalable option 4 is sanger method is cost effective while ngs is expensive so what do you think is the incorrect option if we want to see the difference between the sanger and next generation sequencing okay so now let's see what will be the correct answer so the correct answer is sanger method is cost effective while ngs is expensive so this is the incorrect with regard to the difference because sanger method is already it is also expensive we cannot say that but rest other it tells us about the difference between both these methods sanger and next generation sequencing and in this case i've explained what is sanger sequencing so what are the reaction mixtures that are generally required for sanger sequencing it is also based on the synthesis method in which you for uh, sequencing you design the another sequence so in this we have the primers and dna templates and in place means it is as it is based on the terminations so chain termination by using the dd ntps these are the di deoxy uh, nucleotides so what happens in dd oxy they do not have the 3 prime oh group which is generally required for the phosphodiester bond formation between the two uh, nucleotides so now if uh, 3 prime oh group is not present so now nucleotides won't join and in this way the dna chain will be terminated now due to which you are observing here different uh, fragments that are generated so in this way uh, you also provide it with the normal dntps because then only you will be observing multiple fragments along with dntps you provide the dntps that will lead to chain termination and ultimately after observing means after getting these fragments you will perform capillary gel electrophoresis and laser for excitation and at last you will get the signal in the form of chromatograph and you can understand means by looking at different signals will be produced because these uh, dd uh, ntps are labeled with different dyes different molecules in each of the sample they are labeled differently so for t there will be different a uh, signal that will be produced for c different signal will be produced for a and g different signal will be produced so these fluorescent markers will produce different signals for each of the uh means each of the nucleotide with which you can sequence the uh, give, given segment of the dna so it is based on this type of method of chain termination now let's uh, look for the difference between the sanger sequencing and next generation sequencing so these are few points which i have mentioned so the method which uh, sanger sequencing uses is capillary electrophoresis so after the fragments you obtain you go for the capillary electrophoresis for separating the fragments on the basis of their size or length 
Then in next generation sequencing, it is the high throughput parallel sequencing. And if we look at the read length, then in Sanger sequencing, you can go for the longer re re uh, read lengths. Whereas in NGS, you use the shorter read lengths. So which we also see in the shotgun sequencing that you fragment the entire genome and then you sequence the shorter fragments and later on you assemble those shorter fragments. Then if you look at the throughput, so the Sanger sequencing have a lower throughput that is one sequence at, at a time. But in next generation sequence, sequencing, you can have the high throughput, which means millions of sequences you can simultaneously sequence. Then if you look at the speed, so this Sanger sequencing is quite slow process and it is limited by the capillary electrophoresis. Whereas in NGS, you do not have to perform this capillary electrophoresis. It is the rapid sequencing method and it can generate data in hours to days. If you look at the cost, then cost per base is higher in case of Sanger sequencing because you are performing labeling and all those things. Whereas in case of NGS, it is lower cost per base. And then if we look at the sample requirements. So in Sanger sequencing, you require high quality DNA or RNA samples. So the quality of sample should be higher in both of these methods. But uh, it depends on which platform of the NGS you are using. So it depends at what kind of DNA or RNA samples you require. If we look at the applications, so as it is dealing with the smaller fragments, so it is suitable for the targeted sequencing, which verify the sequence, the known sequence or validating the NGS results when you validate the results because it is working on the shorter fragments, so it is more accurate if we compare to the NGS because NGS is dealing with the larger means it is uh, including the whole genome sequencing due to which it is cumbersome task to do NGS because at last the data which is generated is huge. So means it can interfere with the accuracies. Now let's move to the next question that is BLAST is commonly used for. So I hope you are clear with this term BLAST, which is the basic local sequence alignment tool, alignment search tool. So option one is constructing phylogenetic trees for the organisms based on their sequence diversity. Option two is organizing uh, biological information around the sequences of larger genomes for different species. Option three is comparing the primary biological sequence information such as the amino acid sequences of proteins or the nucleotides of DNA or RNA sequences. And option four is all of these. So what do you think BLAST is commonly used for? Okay, so somebody have mentioned option number three. Okay, so I'll quickly answer the question which somebody has asked regarding the NGS. So in that they've asked that NGS is considered as modified Sanger sequencing. So I have read your third week assignment in which this was the question that is present. So I don't know I'm supposed to answer or not. But I'll just give you the hint that as we are looking for the difference among NGS and Sanger, so do you feel anything like it is modified Sanger sequencing? Do you think, are we modifying this Sanger method only for the NGS? Because they both appear as a bit different. Okay, so next doubt I'll take in the end. So what do you think regarding this? So somebody has mentioned option number three. So yeah, let's see. So BLAST is commonly used for comparing the primary biological sequence information, such as the amino acid sequences of proteins or the nucleotides of DNA or RNA sequences. So now let's see what is BLAST. So its full form is basic local alignment search tool. So it is, uh, it's mainly used to compare the sequences and then identify the similarity that exists. So not just nucleotide sequence, you can also go for the protein sequence to compare. There are different types of BLAST that are available, nucleotide BLAST, BLAST X, C BLAST N, protein BLAST. So in this, I have mentioned the type of BLAST and the nature, and then the program which you use. What is your query? So it depends that what is your query and to what you want to identify, which sequence you want to identify. So the query means the sequence which you are providing database means to which you are searching the alignment. So alignment is nothing. You are looking for the similarity. You are keeping those two sequences <clears throat> one over the another and then you are checking the regions which are conserved in both which are same or which are different. So with that you align two sequences. So firstly is the nucleotide blast. So nucleotide blast means you are dealing with the nucleotide sequence. It could be DNA or RNA. So the program is blast N. So the query will be either DNA or RNA and the database could be either DNA or RNA. So next is the nature is protein blast. Now you have the sequence of protein with you. 
So it depends that what kind of uh, database you want to use. So this type of BLAST is BLAST P. So now if you want to align the proteins, then you will select the BLAST P that is protein BLAST. And then you can provide in the, in the query, you can provide your protein sequence and the database you will choose is the protein. If you want to check for the means for protein, you will already means obviously you will look for its alignment to the protein only. So you can go to the database as protein. Then comes third type of place, BLAST that is mixed BLAST. So in mixed BLAST, different, there are different programs. One is BLAST X, which means the query which you are providing is the translated nucleotide. So this is the translated nucleotide. And then the database, for example, if you want to search the translated nucleotide against the protein, because you have some uh, sequence of the nucleotide. Now you are translating with, you know, means with the information of the codons, you are converting it into the amino acid sequence. So now you can uh, go for the alignment with the protein database. The next one is TBLAST N, which means now you have the protein sequence with you, but you want to check it in the translated nucleotides. So what happened here is that there are different databases which provides you the protein sequence. So when we look at the different transcripts, then the databases which contain the protein sequences, so those informations are experimentally verified. But there are certain proteins um, which are expressed in certain period of time and for those uh, we don't have the sequence in our databases. So um, it's very difficult to identify such proteins. So in that case, what we can do is uh, we can design the translated nucleotides. That means we can um, generate n number of combinations that what are the possible, we can generate six frame, uh, means by changing the six frame, by changing these frames of the nucleotides, we can generate different protein combinations that could be possible and then the protein which are which is available with us in the query we can search it against the translated nucleotide so it is the case where you know that this particular protein sequence might not be available in the reference set so for that we use this and then t blast x means you have translated nucleotide and you are searching it against the translated nucleotides so this um, is all about the blast so in this way you can align the two sequences and it depends what sample, you, what query you have and against what database you want to search it. So now let's uh, move to the question number 11, so which states that in Sanger sequencing, what is used to terminate the DNA strand extension at the specific basis? So option one is radioactive isotopes. Option two is fluorescently labeled dideoxynucleotides, that is GDNTPs, DNA polymerase and RNA primers. So I hope this question is quite easy. You can easily answer this. Okay, yeah, so it is obvious that option two is the correct answer because we have already seen in the previous uh, explanation of Sanger sequencing. So these DDNTPs, they are dideoxynucleotides which are labeled with some fluorescently, since they are fluorescently labeled to specifically identify different nucleotides and they lack three prime hydroxyl group due to which they leads to chain termination. So this is the uh, structure of this dideoxynucleotide. So now in the three prime position, you can see there is only H. So in this, in the topmost uh, ribose sugar, you can see in the third three prime position, there was OH group where this phosphodiester bond was being formed due to which it was linked with this three prime OH group to the five prime uh, carbon of the another ribose sugar in the DNA. So now it is now not having this three prime OH group due to which it will stop synthesis. So this is um, the idea behind the DDNTPs and how that terminates the um, chain synthesis. So now let's look the next question, which state, which of the following is a key application of DNA sequencing in genomics? So option one is making vaccines. Option two is identifying suspects in criminal investigations. Option three is studying genetic variations in populations. And option four is producing synthetic proteins. So now you have to tell the applications of DNA sequencing. Why do we go for DNA sequencing? If we talk about genomics, because genomics is the study of genes that are present at particular point of time. So, okay, option three. What about others? Somebody else wants to answer? Okay, so now let's see. So the correct option is, Option number three, that is studying genetic variations in populations. 
So now, uh, making vaccines, identifying suspects in criminal investigations, and producing synthetic proteins. So these could also be done with the help of DNA sequencing. But the key application, if we talk in the terms of genomics, so then it is studying genetic variations in populations. And it could form the basis for uh, understanding the evolution. And also you can see the disease, that how the disease is uh, affecting the populations. What is the genetic basis for a particular disease? So for that, DNA sequencing can help you. So now let's see. When we, uh, there are different types of uh, DNA sequencing can be categorized as first generation, second generation, then third generation. So first generation were the techniques which were older techniques that, that are Sanger sequencing, Maxim Gilbert, or Sanger chain termination, one of the same. So they infer the nucleotide identity using DNTPs and then visualize the electrophoresis. So they used electrophoresis techniques, means in uh, Sanger sequencing, we observed that it's one of the major limitation that it is using the capillary electrophoresis due to which the these processes are a bit slow. The sequencing takes time and it's very costly. And then how many base pair fragments you can observe means you can sequence at a time is 500 to 1000 base pair, which is quite small. It can be used for the targeted um, sequencing, but not for the bigger genomes. So it is a short read sequencing method. Then comes second generation, which is also known as next generation sequencing. So the methods are 454. 454 is nothing but pyro sequencing, and then Solexa, then ion torrent, and Illumina. So these are different sequencing methods, and they are high throughput from the parallelization of sequencing reactions. So in this, you can run multiple reactions at the same time, but their length is 50 to 500 base pairs, which is quite small. But yeah, this, these are providing you the high throughput. That means uh, you can perform these in the parallel. So parallelization you can perform. Then comes third generation methods, so which are working on the long reach sequencing, such as PEGBIO, uh, Pacific Biosciences, or Oxford Nanopore. So these are quite means highly specialized methods. These, these can sequence native DNA in the real time with the single molecule resolution. And it uh, can sequence up to tens of kbs of fragments on average. So these are the long reach sequencing methods. So in this way, the NGS has advanced, means the sequencing, DNA sequencing has advanced with upcoming technologies. And in this, I have also provided the comparison. So the people who are interested, they can see that uh, how these different types of sequencing methods, how they vary, what is the accuracy, what is the read length, how many reads uh, per run it can go for, what time it requires, what is the cost, advantages and their disadvantages. So you can see this. Now let's look at the applications. So by using the next generation sequencing, what are the applications? So what questions the scientists can ask and they get answers. So NGS can um, allow to ask to rapidly sequence the whole genomes. You can deeply sequence the target regions as, as well. You can utilize the RNA sequencing to discover novel RNA variants and splice variants. Uh, and you can also quantify the mRNA for gene expression analysis. And then you can also analyze epigenetic factors such as genome-wide DNA methylations and DNA protein interactions that might be affecting the expression of the protein uh, for the particular DNA, how it is later on means due to epigenetic modifications, what are the effects on the expression of that particular gene. Then you can sequence cancer and cancer samples to study the rare somatic variations, rare somatic variants, tumor subclones, and more. So by looking at the mutations and the variants, means the samples you collect from the cancer patients and you compare it with the normal patients, and then you can look for the variants, genetic variants that are observed in those patients. So with that, you can draw the conclusions that this particular variation is involved in the disease. You can also study the human microbiome and you can identify the novel pathogens with the help of the next generation sequencing. So these all are the advanced applications of NGS. And these can expand. So these are very, means these are few applications which I have provided here. So now let's uh, move to the next question. That is question number 30. So what percentage of the human genome is estimated to consist of known coding DNA? So this thing we have heard that major fraction of the human genome is the known coding part and very lesser part is the coding part. So now what do you think? What is the percentage? So option one is less than 10%. Option two is approximately 25%. Option three is around 50% and option four is over 90%. So what do you think? What percentage? 
ऑप्शन फोर नाइस सो या द ऑप्शन करेक्ट ऑप्शन इज ओवर नाइंटी परसेंट एंड दिस ऑब्वियस मीन दिस इज ऑलरेडी क्लियर दैट मेजर फ्रैक्शन ऑफ आर जीनोम इज कम्पोज ऑफ द नोन कोडिंग डी एन ए एंड दिस नोन कोडिंग डी एन ए इट इज नॉट मीन वी आर सेंग इट नोन कोडिंग इन टर्म्स ऑफ प्रोटीन बट इट इज नॉट कोडिंग फॉर प्रोटीन बट इट हैज फंक्शन टू प्ले सो द फंक्शन विच इट प्लेज इज रेगुलेटरी एलिमेंट्स सो दीज नोन कोडिंग डी एन इन्वॉल्व द रेगुलेटरी एलिमेंट्स इन ट्रॉन्स एंड द अदर सिक्वेंसिस एंड दे प्ले रोल इन द रेगुलेशन ऑफ द पर्टिकुलर जीन सो दे कैन डिसाइड दैट एट वट टाइम पीरियड दिस जीन विल बी एक्सप्रेस एट वट लेवल दिस जीन विल बी एक्सप्रेस सो ऑल दीज थिंग्स हैव रेगुलेटरी रोल्स due to which they are very important in our genome now let's move to next question which of the following organisms has a gene has a genome that is significantly larger and more complex than the human genome so in this you have to tell that which of these uh, organism you think would have the complex genome that means greater number of genes as compared to the human because when we look at the evolution what we believe is that uh, with evolution the complexity increases the humans are more complex if we look at prokaryotes they are less complex so what do you think that which one of the organisms could be more complex than human so option 1 is fruit fly which is also known as drosophila melanogaster then option 2 is c elegans known as round worm option 3 is maize also known as cone option 4 is amoeba so what do you think which individual would be having the genome complexity greater than human Okay, so somebody is saying fruit fly. Okay, why do you think think so? That Drosophila will be more complex than human. Okay, let's see what will be the correct option. Okay. Nice. So yeah, option three is correct. That is maize or corn. So comparatively, plants are the one which shows complex genome. So in this, the maize is the correct option. And for this, you must be aware with the term which is known as whole genome duplication. So whole genome duplication. So there are certain species which have undergone whole genome duplications due to which they have, I uh, means, they shows greater complexity at the level of genome. So similarly, plants are also ones. which have undergone this whole genome duplication due to which they have complexity of genome greater than humans so now i will be um, so firstly let's look at the reasoning so maize has a genome that is significantly larger and more complex than human genome with the high proportion of repetitive dna so now the complexity has increased but repetitive dna content has increased so now let's see the comparative table in which i have provided you all these Five and five organisms and the number of genes that are present, genome size and repetitive DNA content. So you can see that the largest number of genes are present in the maize, that is thirty-two thousand, and then genome size is twenty-three hundred MB, and the repetitive DNA content is about eighty-five percent. So in this, you can see that the number of genes are also highest, but repetitive DNA content is also highest among all of these. so fruit fly is the one which is having the about 1400 and amoeba is having about 1300 genes sorry 13000 and 14000 genes so these are nearly comparable then c elegans is having 20000 genes which is little bit comparable to human and human can have 20000 to 25000 uh, protein coding genes so if we compare all these so we can see that genome complexity has increased but at the same time repetitive dna content has also increased in the case of maize and hence it is more complex so now let's quickly see the next question which says illumina sequencing is based on which of the following principles option 1 is pyro sequencing option 2 is single molecule real time smrt sequencing or sequencing by synthesis or chain termination sequencing so other than this option 2 we have i think discussed all these three options so what do you think what could be the correct option for this which principle this illumina sequencing would be based okay so somebody is mentioning pyro sequencing
Okay, so let's see what principle this is based. So, Illumina sequencing is not based on the pyro sequencing, but it is based on the sequencing by synthesis. So, now we'll means see that why it is based on sequencing by synthesis. So, firstly, you should also look here that this Illumina sequencing, it's based on the sequencing by synthesis method and it relies on the incorporation of fluorescently labeled nucleotides during the DNA replication. Yeah, so it is the next generation sequencing method, first of all, based on sequencing by synthesis and it required dye terminators. And the dyes, they will be identified at the later stages to means, identify the DNA strands. So now in this, the first step in Illumina sequencing is the library preparation in which you have the genomic DNA, you fragment it, and then you ligate the adapters to those fragments which are generated, and then sequencing library will be generated. So in this, NGS library is prepared by fragmented uh, genomic DNA sample and then ligating specialized adapters to both the fragments of the ends. So both the fragment ends. Now this is the first step to prepare the library. So now second step is the cluster generation. So in cluster generation, the library is loaded into the flow cell and the fragments are hybridized to the flow cell surface. Each bound fragment is amplified into the clonal clusters through bridge amplification. So now in this, multiple clusters will be formed and there will be bridge amplification. So polymerases will be provided. Now there will be the synthesis of the complementary strands. So due to which it is also known as uh, sequencing by synthesis method. So there will be bridge amplification cycles in which multiple clusters will be formed. This is the second step. Now third step is the sequencing. So now clusters have been formed. So in sequencing reagents, including fluorescently labeled nucleotides are added and the first base is incorporated. So the flow cell is imaged and the emission from the each cluster is recorded. So as in this case, you are providing it with the labeled nucleotides. So at, at each step, you will take the digital image, which will provide you that what is the uh, nucleotide that is attached depending on the uh, fluorescent signal which you obtain. So it will be very specific for a particular type of nucleotide. So it will tell you the sequence and the emission wavelength and intensity are used to identify the base and the cycle is repeated n number of times to create a read length of n bases and for example if the two uh, sequences are then incorporated so in that case the intensity of that signal which is uh, contributing to that nucleotide so intensity will increase which means that there are now dinucleotides similar dinucleotides are present so this step is sequencing step and it is followed by the alignment and data analysis so in the end, you will get the reads, you will align them and you will generate a reference genome because you have taken the, you have fragmented the genomic DNA in the first step. So at last you have to perform the assembly. You, you have to assemble those smaller fragments by overlapping them, by observing the overlaps and then designing the reference genome. So this is all about the Illumina sequencing. It is based on the sequence by synthesis approach, not on the pyro sequencing or other methods. So I hope it is clear. Now let's move to the next question, which says, what is the primary advantage of Illumina sequencing technology? So now as we have seen this Illumina sequencing, so what do you think would be the primary advantage? So first option is long read lens. Option two is real time sequencing. Option three is high throughput and parallel sequencing. And option four is minimal uh, sample preparation. Okay, so somebody have mentioned option three. Now let's see. So yeah, correct option will be the higher throughput and parallel sequencing because we have seen that long read lens. So it is not for the long reads. It is the short. It is based on the short read lens sequencing, and then it is helping in the high throughput and parallel sequencing because we have seen that there is a cluster formation in which multiple sequences were parallelly sequenced. And it, it is having high throughput. High throughput is also have the same meaning. So it is known for, known for its high throughput capabilities and it allows you to uh, simultaneously sequence million of DNA fragments due to which uh, it means the high throughput. So now let's see the next question, which is also related to Illumina sequencing itself. So in Illumina sequencing, what is the role of adapters? So in that case, you have observed that in the first step, uh, when you have fragmented the DNA, so after that you were um, ligating it with the adapters at both the ends. So what do you think, what would be the role of these adapters? So first option is to label the DNA with the fluorescent markers. Option two is to attach the DNA fragments to the solid surface. 
Option 3 is to terminate DNA strand extension and option 4 is to amplify the DNA fragments. So what do you think would be the possible role of these adapters? Why are we uh, going for the ligation of adapters? Okay, somebody is saying option number 4. Okay, so now let's see what is the role of these adapters. So the role of these adapters is not for the amplification, but to attach the DNA fragments to the solid surface. Um, because in that we have seen that, uh, let's move to that. So in Illumina sequencing, here you can see that now adapters are joined. So after this, now you are providing it the flow cell. So for the flow cell binding, you uh, these adapters will bind to this flow cell. So this flow cell will be having the complementary sequences to that of the adapters due to which adapters now will bind, which are adapters are now linked to the another uh, uh, DNA sequence. So what happens here is that in certain cases, uh, as you have uh, attached the adapters on both the ends, so in certain cases, it will form a bridge. So in that case, it will, uh, the DNA strand will be folded and it will be, uh, it will get twisted. So in, it will construct a bridge kind of thing. So this is the role of the adapter that helps in the binding of this particular DNA strand to the surface to the solid surface. So this was the role of the adapters. Now let's move to the next question, which says, and the term high throughput sequencing in NGS refers to, because in the previous all the techniques, we have come across this word a lot of times. So what do you think is high throughput sequencing mean? So option one is slow and labor intensive sequencing methods. Option two is low cost sequencing technologies. Option three is simultaneous sequencing of multiple DNA fragments. And option four is sequencing of small genomes so what do you think is high throughput sequencing because we have observed it a lot of times okay so many uh, people have answered option three now let's see so option three is the correct because it is giving you the advantage of simultaneous sequencing of multiple dna fragments at the same time so that is high throughput and all other options were incorrect okay now let's move to the next question, which says, what is the primary advantage of paired end sequencing in NGS? So I hope you have come across this word pair and sequencing in your lectures. So what is the primary advantage of this pair and sequencing? Option one is reduced cost of, cost of sequencing. Option two is longer read lengths. Option three is increased accuracy of sequencing. And option four is information about both the ends of DNA fragments. Okay, now let's see which is the correct option. So yeah, option four is the correct because it will provide you the information about both the ends of the DNA fragments. Now let's quickly see what is paired end sequencing. So unlike the single read sequencing, the pair end sequencing as the name suggests paired end. So it allows the users to sequence both the ends of the fragments and generate high quality and alignable sequence data. So in this, this is the read one, this is the read two. So in this, you are sequencing this particular sequence from both the sides and the paired in sequencing facilities, it helps, it facilitates you to detect, uh, detect the genomic rearrangements, repetitive sequences, as well as gene fusions and novel transcripts. So how you will identify the no, uh, repeats? For example, in this, this particular region is mapping to this and the similar uh, is mapping to this. So these sequences are the repeats. So in this way, repeats can be identified if you are sequencing from both the ends. So you can identify this, uh, you can uh, align those, you can align those overlapping reads and you can see that uh, whether they are uh, means repeats or what kind of sequences they are. So this information can be observed with the help of paired and sequencing. Now I have provided you the table of difference between the paired and sequencing and the single end sequencing. So these are different aspects. Uh, on the basis of which you can draw differences between both of them. So if we look at the, in the terms of detecting structural variations, so if you use paired end sequencing, so you can identify insertions, deletions, duplications, and translocations more accurately by analyzing the distance and the orientation between paired reads. And if you look at the single end sequencing, so its ability is limited to detect the structural variations due to lack of paired read information because you are sequencing from one direction only. 
then if you look at improved map mapping accuracy so in paired and sequencing mapping accuracy already increased increases especially in the repetitive regions as paired reads can help resolve ambiguous mapping uh, whereas in single and sequencing it may have mapping difficulties in repetitive regions leading to lower accuracy so as in this you are uh, means in this uh, paired end you are sequencing from both the ends so now uh, even if the read means because our read length will also be increased so in this case the repetitive uh, regions could be now identified because they are already linked to some other read as well so whereas in single read uh, you won't be able to identify whether that is the repeated uh, read or whether that particular read is the same same read which is means amplified that is i mean these repetitive regions becomes ambiguous in cases of single end sequencing as compared to the paired end then if we look at enhanced coverage uniformity so paired end uh, sequencing provides you more uniform coverage across the target regions reducing the coverage gaps and bias whereas single end its coverage is less uniform and potentially lead to uneven representation of genomic regions for example uh, we know that there are major number of repeats that are present in our genome so those um, appears as means appears difficult in single end sequencing to deal with then snps and indel calling accuracy so improved accuracy in calling for the snps that is single nucleotide polymorphisms and small insertion deletions due to supporting evidence from both the ends of the fragments because uh, support will be available from both the ends whereas uh, in the single end slightly reduced accuracy in snp and indel calling compared to the paired end sequencing now if we look at transcriptome analysis so paired end read uh, parent sequencing it is very useful for studying the gene expression and isoform diversity uh, because it will also provide you information regarding the splice junctions and transcript boundaries whereas the single end is less informative and then if we look at the library preparation is so library preparation uh, may be complex because you are synthesizing paired end uh, means in paired end you have to sequence the adapters from both the ends due to which the library preparation could be complex and whereas in single end sequencing it is simpler because it is in this you only have to synthesize the adapters at the single end only so it requires less optimization so overall if we see then we uh, have seen that paired end sequencing is better as compared to single end sequencing if we ignore the library pre preparation complexities okay so now let's move to the next question which ngs technology is known for its ability to generate long reads with minimal sample preparation option 1 is illumina sequencing option 2 is iron torrent sequencing option 3 is pec bio that is specific biosciences sequencing and option 4 is solid that is sequencing by oligonucleotide ligation and detection sequencing so uh, when we were discussing about the dna sequencing different generations there also we covered this part so what do you think would be the possible answer for this question which ngs technology we would use because uh, it provides the long reads with minimal sample preparation okay so let's see so the correct option is option number 3 that is pec bio pacific biosciences so when we were discussing that uh, different generations of sequencing so in that for the longer reads there were oxford nanopore method and the pec bio method which you use generally when you have to sequence the entire genomes so it is uh, it is recognized for its ability to produce long reads without the need for extensive sample preparation now let's quickly see what is pec bio sciences sequencing so it is developed by pacific bio sciences due to which it got its name as pec bio sequencing and it is a single molecule real time dna sequencing technology so it is real time dna sequencing technology which will give you real time results and it is known for its long read lens higher accuracy and ability to capture epigenetic information as well so it directly sequences the individual dna molecules making it valuable for applications such as de novo genome assembly structural variant detection and epigenetic research so in this you start with the high quality dna strand that is double stranded dna then you prepare the smart bell libraries so these are the smart bell libraries in which this dna strand and then this particular uh, probe you see so you anneal these primers to these uh, particular segments that are present in the ends so after annealing the primers dna polymerase will bind and it will synthesize the 
uh, newer strand. So uh, now this particular these uh, SMRT bells, which are synthesized at the terminal regions, so these are the bell kind of structures. So these are the this will help in circularizing the DNA. So circularized DNA sequence in the repeated passes. Now this particular polymerase with the primer, it will with the help of the primer, it will now begin the extension of the particular DNA. So the polymerase reads are trimmed of the adapters to yield the subreads. So now you'll obtain the subreads and consensus and methylation status are called from the subreads, due to which it also provides you with the epigenetic information as well. And in this, you will in the end you will get the hyphae read, which will having which will have the 99.9 percent .9 accuracy. So let's uh, means to better understand this, let's look at this table in which there are different steps that are involved in the sequencing by PEC bio, and there are de description of each step. So firstly, you prepare a library. So preparation of library means that um, you obtain the samples and then. Uh, means you make it ready for sequencing. So that is known as the stage where you prepare the library. So firstly, DNA samples is shared into smaller fragments or size selected to obtain the target fragment lens and adapters are ligated to the DNA fragments. So as they are providing you the long read DNA sequencing, but you can also uh, it means adjust the length of the fragments which you want because they are they can sequence the larger fragments. So you can um, decide the fragment length and at last you can obtain the target fragments and then adapters can be ligated to those DNA fragments. So what is smart bell formation? So when adapters are circularized, creating these smart bell templates containing the DNA fragments with the adapters on both ends. So in this you can see this blue region. So it represents the adapters that are attached to this double stranded DNA, which is enclosing this DNA and it is forming a bell like structure. So this is known as the smart bell formation in which DNA fragments and with the adapters on the both the ends, they create the smart bell like template. Now the third step is binding and loading. So now if smart bell templates are bound to the surface of SMRT cells. So as you know, in Illumina also we read that what is the role of these like, uh, uh, sorry, adapters. So they helps you to bind to the cellulite surface. So in this case also these uh, smart bell templates, they are bound to the surface of smart cells. And then uh, which are the platforms for the sequencing? So in the fourth step, there will be sequencing. So smart cells are loaded into the sequencer. DNA polymerase is immobilized at the bottom of each uh, zero mode waveguide and where it incorporates fluorescently labeled nucleotides. So in this, uh, the nucleotides that are supplied will be fluorescently labeled due to which uh, we'll be able to identify different nucleotides that are joined. And along with this, there is also the, I mean, we also provide the primer with which the extension will be performed by DNA polymerase. So this process is monitored in real time as DNA polymerase synthesizes the complementary strand. So it is based on the principle of sequencing by synthesis. So it is synthesizing the complementary strand and at the same time, the sequence is being, um, means it's being judged that what sequence is formed. So at the real time, the information is being extracted from the, I mean, it is being monitored. So uh, fifth step is data collection. So now fluorescent signals that are emitted during the nucleotide incorporation are recorded. So as some nucleotide attaches, it gives some uh, fluorescent signal. So it is captured and then it is converted into the sequencing data. So multiple passes are obtained for each DNA template, which improves its accuracy. And next you perform data analysis in which the sequencing data, which is processed, it is generate uh, means it is processed to generate the high quality reads. You perform base calling error correction and consensus uh, sequence generation are performed. So means you can, uh, take the multiple samples and you can then uh, generate the uh, ensemble of the DNA samples as an ensemble of the sequences and then you can verify you can analyze that um, means will, uh, is it correct you can perform base calling and error correction things so it is done on the consensus sequence generations so means you generate a consensus of DNA sequences and then you analyze it that means the sequence which you got whether it is accurate or not so then comes epigenetic analysis. You can also perform these analysis. So additional analysis can be done to detect the DNA modification such as DNA methylation using kinetic information from the sequencing process. So this will also provide you the epigenetic information. Then comes data interpretation. So now you have obtained the sequence. So what you can do, what I mean, what interpretation you can do. So uh, genome assembly, variant calling, transcriptome analysis and epigenetic studies. So these all kinds of interpretations can be performed on the sequences that are obtained by the PEC biosciences sequencing method. So at the same time, 
it will tell you about the epigenetic modification that either the DNA is modified at some point, whether there is DNA methylations. So all those things can be explored with the help of PEG biosciences. So now let's uh, look at the ion torrent sequencing that what kind of sequencing method is this. So it is also it also comes under the next generation sequencing. But um, as we talked about the PEG biosciences, it is dealing with the longer length of the DNA sequence that could be sequenced. But in the ion torrent, uh, it comes under the next generation sequencing. It is not on not for the longer and longer length fragments. So it, it, it utilizes the semiconductor based technology to detect the change in the pH. So uh, the previous method we discussed, it was based on the fluorescent labels. So different fluorescent signals are obtained. So it means uh, different nucleotides are there. So for, so for each nucleotide, there will be different fluorescent signal that will be generated. Similarly, in this case, um, the incorporation um, of a particular nucleotide is just with the help of change in pH. Because as hydrogen ions are released during the DNA synthesis, so if DNA synthesis will happen, so it will release some hydrogen ions due to which there will be change in the pH. So it also allows you for the rapid and cost effective DNA sequencing. And this, if you add the DNTPs that build the DNA sequence, so you provide one DNTP at the time and you know which DNTP you are providing. So if it will bind, then there will be the generation of hydrogen ions and pH will change. And for example, you provide some DNTP for which the complementary sequence is not uh, available. Means so if it will not bind, then there will be no change in the pH. So with which you can, in the end, you can know that which nucleotide is now has bound to that particular sequence and when the change in pH was observed. So this is the principle of ion torrent sequencing. And in this, I have mentioned the steps that how this ion torrent sequencing works. So it also begins with the library preparation. So in this also, you fragment the DNA, you adapt, uh, you ligate it with the adapters on the ends. And then emulsion PCR, because in this uh, you are dealing with the pH changes. So you need to design the emulsion PCR in which DNA fragments are clonally amplified within the oil and water emulsion droplets, each containing a single DNA fragment. So you perform its amplification. Then ion sphere particle enrichment. So isolated ion sphere particles, each containing amplified DNA are collected and they are loaded into the semiconductor chip, which can uh, capture the change in the pH. So sequencing chip loading. So this um, ISP, that is the isolated ion sphere particles, so they attach to the DNA fragments and they are immobilized on the semiconductor chip in the microwells with each well representing a small, uh, a single sequencing reaction. So it is based on the sequencing by synthesis because whenever uh, the complementary sequence binding will happen, the complementary nucleotide will bind, then only it will release H positive ions. So it is also based on the sequencing by synthesis method. So in this DNA synthesis occur on the chip and at each base each, and as the each base is incorporated, it releases the hydrogen ions which cause the change in the pH and that is detected by the sensors. So data acquisition, the pH change are recorded for each well in the real time which generate the sequence of data as the chip undergoes synthesis, uh, sequencing by synthesis and at last you analyze the data that means uh, sequencing data is processed to determine the order of incorporated bases and final sequence is generated. And quality scores are also assigned for each base. So this is all about the ion torrent sequencing. And I'm not sure whether it was covered in your lectures or not. So it was all about ion torrent. Now let's see what is solid sequencing because it was mentioned in the option, one of the options. So the solid sequencing, it is another approach and it stands for the sequencing by oligonucleotide ligation and detection. So like Sanger sequencing is based on the detection of the fluorescent signals with different, uh, with the difference that in uh, Sanger sequencing, you use the fluorophore for each individual nucleotides. Whereas in solid sequencing, a fluorophore is used, is used for the given combination of two nucleotides. So now in this, you uh, sequence the dinucleotides at the same time, instead of uh, sequencing the single nucleotide. So this is the, uh, method that how it works. So in this you are providing it with the different uh, dinucleotides. In, uh, for specific dinucleotide there would be a different fluorescent tag that is attached and now whenever it will ligate if that particular dinucleotide is present so that particular fluorescent tag is now uh, means we will observe that that we will observe that signal so we will know that this particular dinucleotide is now attached. So in this way this is the only difference and then 
image is captured so you remove the label that is bound to the dinucleotide so that remove uh, label is now removed and now similarly add the fresh probes and repeat for seven cycles similarly this process goes on you denature remove and synthesized strands and n minus one primer continues the cycle so in this uh, you anneal different primers and you extend this cycle so at last you determine the template sequence by knowing the identity of adapter base that is a and the color sequence so these are the um, color codes so for example if a is present so the color will be blue for example if ag is present the color is yellow if g and c dinucleotides are present color will be red so in like sanger only there are different fluorescent tags that are used but in sanger we were dealing with the one nucleotide sequence in this we are dealing with two nucleotide sequence so for a dinucleotide a specific fluorescent signal will be available so these are the steps so first step is library preparation which involves the dna sample fragmentation and then ligating it with the adapters to create sequencing templates second step is the oligonucleotide probe hybridization in which uh, the short fluorescently labeled oligonucleotide probes are hybridized to the dna template so these are just the shorter oligonucleotide probes which are further cut and removed in this step so then comes ligation and detection a series of ligation reactions occurs fluorescent signal are recorded after each ligation and revealing the sequence information so as sequence information is observed then this particular label will be removed and at last for the data analysis so emitted colors from the fluorescent signals are interpreted to determine the sequence of nucleotides in the dna template generating the sequencing data so at each level you keep the signals with you and at last you will generate the sequence out of those signals so you will be having the information regarding the signal for each dinucleotide that you could probably see and at last you can synthesize a segment um, means dna sequence that could be possible by looking at those signals so this is all about the uh, sequencing different types of sequencing so now we'll uh, deal with the doubts which you have and you can also ask um, if you want to ask something this is all with the content so i have nothing else now let me um, look into your doubts okay so uh, you have doubt in the question number 6 it was can we say the fragments of dna sequence systematically short to long or randomly Okay, let me okay so host vector yeah so hmm. prerequisite for hmm So uh, when I was uh, discussing, okay. so hmm. no, no, no. It is it depends on you because when we were so host vector is generally used for the yeah it is used for the clonal amplification of certain fragments. So mostly in short gun sequencing, we generally do not use this clonal amplification, but we can use. Means to increase the DNA fragments that we have. This will ultimately help us in the. Uh, this will aid in the precision of the sequencing method. So it is. It is not the essential prerequisite, but we can use. It. Yeah. Hmm. But if this option is not provided to us, that is information on the position of DNA fragments, then if some other option is available, which is the prerequisite for short gun, then we could have selected host, host vector instead of this option. But yeah, in this case, this option seems more known essential as compared to the host vector.
Joo. Yeah, so random because then the sample you have multiple fragments that are present so there will be random amplifications of all and at last you will overlap them. yeah okay so then somebody asked as ngf requires cloned modified template okay so Cloned modified, I'm a bit unclear with this question. What do you want to say with this? Because we, uh, in NGS, uh, template here, you want to say the sequence which you have and you want to identify the sequence of that particular, means uh, the DNA which you have, but you want to look for the sequence of that DNA. So for that, you're saying this template or what does this template mean? Because it could have multiple meanings. Are you there? Hmm. Many people have given the questions in the chat, so I'm answering those questions. Okay, so let me finish this. So, uh, Ricky, you can clear, clarify this question. Then you asked, are the next generation sequencing techniques considered as modified? Yeah, for this, I have given you the hint, but I won't give you the correct answer for this. Okay, so host vector I've already defined. And then, um, so somebody has asked that, um, uh, will the NGS be completely replaced the Oxford nanopore tech in upcoming years. So, is it the other way around or what do you want to say that NGS will replace the Oxford nanopore or Oxford nanopore will replace NGS? Because next generation sequencing methods are for the short range sequencing, but these Oxford nanopore and the bio sciences, which we have seen, Pacific biosciences, so they are for the entire genome. But it, uh, still, we can't say that one of them will overpower any other. But yeah, Oxford Nanopore and the Pacific, they have helped us a lot because at the same time, they are giving us the sequence information and they are also sequencing the entire genome. But at the same time, the analysis and interpretation and handling is a bit difficult due to which we use the NGS. Since, um, instead of this Oxford Nanopore and Pacific Biosciences, it depends that what kind of sequencing you want to do. So if your aim is to detect the targeted sample, so targeted sequence, so then you will go with the short rate sequencing methods. But if you want to deal with the genome, then you go for these methods. But yeah, there are certain difficulties and cumbersome, this is a cumbersome task to deal with the genome. So when you deal with these methods, so there are some difficulties that are being there. So you can't say that one of the method is the one which will be accepted. But if we talk about the first generation sequencing methods, so then we can say that the NGS methods have replaced those first generation because they were costly and time consuming. So NGS methods were better. But in NGS and the third generation ones, uh, we can't say. It depends that what kind of the samples we want to sequence. Okay. So. Uh, Okay, when we say a shotgun sequencing methods, are we including all the NGS and third generation sequencing methods? Okay, so shotgun sequencing method, shotgun sequencing is basically the approach, but then it comes that what are the sequencing methods which you are using. So in shotgun sequencing, firstly, uh, what we do is, it is mainly the principle of this method is that you are fragmenting the DNA into the smaller reads. But when we talk about third generation sequencing method, so in that we mainly do not fragment into smaller regions, but it depends on us that for means we can get certain longer fragments. So we can say that uh, shotgun sequencing methods are including the NGS, but 
for third generation we can't say that the shotgun sequencing methods are used for the third generation sequencing methods also because they are dealing with the longer reads and shotgun is about the fragmenting into smaller regions and then assembling those reads by overlapping uh, the shorter reads and then assembling it into the larger genome so i don't think it will be uh, included in the third generation. so third generation sequencing will also include it in it then uh, does reverse complementarity only needed during the readout following sequencing only uh, re needed during the readouts uh, following sequencing so in this also i'm not clear with the question where the reverse complementarity is applicable okay so first of all uh, we must know that what the reverse complementarity means so when we perform certain hybridizations or uh, sequencing by synthesis methods so in that we require the reverse complementarity because uh, the fragment will bind only when they are the when the reverse complementarity signal means the sequence uh, should be reverse reverse complementary complementary to that particular dna or anything so in this case uh, in the terms of sequencing so if particular uh, nucleotide for example let's take the example of sanger sequencing so in sanger sequencing also or in the pyro sequencing or other methods which are based on the sequencing by synthesis so whenever the particular nucleotide is having the reverse complementarity complementary a uh, nucleotide in the that particular dna which we have then only the binding will happen and then only the readout will be gen means uh, we obtain the readout because it will either release pyrophosphate or it will either release to chain termination or it will either release hydrogen h positive ions so all those things they, they are based on the reverse complementary complementary only if reverse complementary um, the particular dnt with that which is coming if it is not reverse complementary so it will not generate anything so uh, for that we will not get the readout we will only get the readout when the coming upcoming the nucleotide will is reverse complementary to the given dna sequence that we have given dna fragment we can say because sequencing is done at the later stage so there are different methods for which reverse complementary thing is valid for example if we uh, talk about other hybridization methods so they are also based on this reverse complementary when we talk about the uh, when we were uh, talking about that antibody binding to the dna protein complex so that binding is also based on the reverse complementary binding reverse complementary is also observed when we uh, say that uh, protein in translation also we see this same thing that if particular uh, fragment of um, mrna we have so the trna which binds that is also reverse complementary complementary to that region so all these things are based on the reverse complementary uh, principle so in, in terms of sequencing i have told that yeah in different sequencing methods this reverse complementary has a role to play and these are the other things where it is applicable so uh, you can ask the questions so any other doubt if you have so you can ask so i'm done with the chat questions okay so just now i got one so balaji sir you can ask if you want then i'll answer this question okay thank you so now the question is does blast have the capacity to generate query sequence on its own or rather it can only be used to compare with the pre stored sequences present in ncbi library okay so um, i think you are taking hints from me regarding the week 3 assignment questions okay so first of all the blast is a tool which provides you to align the sequence so blast is for this the database which you choose that is fixed means that is the already for which already information is available with blast but the query is provided by you so the query which you provide it can come from anywhere why would you use blast otherwise and this one of the application of blast is that it can also help you to uh, identify the novel genes for example you have some unknown gene which you have obtained and now you want to know that 
to which or uh, for example not just gene but for genome also you can get so now you want to see that from which means where you can place it in the taxonomy so you can identify the evolutionary information by performing the alignment and you will perform that alignment of that particular so in this case you'll uh, perform blast n if you have the nucleotide sequence and then you'll be able to see that to which of the genes it will it is aligning which of the genomes it is aligning with the higher level with the greater score so there is a score which is generated it means the better the alignment better will be the score so in the end so better score will obtain so if it is uh, showing better alignment to some gene of the organism so with that you can say that these two individuals these two organisms might be they are homologous or might be they are orthologous they are, might be related to one another so in that way you can place those genes or those genomes in the means taxonomy you can classify them so this is the main advantage of blast that you can also uh, characterize the unknown gene which you have so means what we say is that if we have some gene then if the two uh, genes are identical in the sequence means they won't be identical but if two genes are sharing some kind of similarity then they might be having similar functional uh, divergence a similar function at the level of protein as well so in blast this will also help you to get some idea about the functionality of the gene and to get the evolutionary uh, information regarding the gene that to which species it is more similar so all those things you can do with the blast so the query is up to you so i hope you got some hint regarding this now um, how do you make these clean and Okay, so uh, this question, I'm just, uh, I just have got the previous year questions. I'm just updating in that, updating those questions in my PPTs. And then if I feel like I need some information to add, so I search for that topic and then I add. And thank you so much for this compliment. Okay, so can phylogenetic trees can draw ancestral relationship in between all organisms? So when we say phylogenetic trees, so first of all, they tell us about the ancestral comparisons. But if pro we provide the information of all the ancestral genes, because the um, phylogenetic trees, how they are constructed means firstly, uh, to construct a phylogenetic tree, you should have sufficient information in your hand. If you have the sequence information, then you compare all those sequences by you can perform multiple sequence alignment and there are various methods with which you can generate these phylogenetic trees so um, different algorithms are being used so what is the main means uh, base of the phylogenetic tree is that you compare multiple sequences and the sequences which are uh, more similar to one another they are placed in the one group and then the sequences that are showing major variations they are placed in the another group so in that way you construct different branches and then there will be nodes, internodes. So in that way, the phylogenetic trees uh, constructed. But for all organisms, if you provide the information of all the organisms, then you can look for the ancestral relationship. But this question is also in your assignment, uh, third week assignment. So I won't answer it directly. But yeah, you can see, you can say that uh, the phylogenetic trees will only provide you the ancestral relationship for the sequences for the information which you provide and now it depends that what information you are providing for all organisms or for limited organisms so in that way it will give you the information with the between the sequences so does blast have any role in developing a phylogenetic tree to understand the evolution okay so you are asking me the questions which are in your assignments, but I'll also give you the hint regarding this question. So when we say blast, so we are uh, mainly focusing on identifying the, means we are aligning the sequences and then we are identifying that whether they share some kind of sequence similarity. So there are two terms, one is sequence similarity and one is sequence identity. So when we say sequence identity, which means that two sequences are exactly identical, they have exactly same nucleotides in terms of uh, pro, uh, sorry dna and when we talk about proteins then identical means they have similar means identical exactly same uh, amino acids but when we say similar so similarity means that there could be some uh, 
differences that could be present but they share some kind of similar functions for example in terms of uh, amino acids we see that there are certain amino acids which share some kind of similar biochemical properties so now they if they are present in the two different protein sequences so now they will be uh, termed as the two proteins have some variations and those variations are not having major impact they are sharing similar physico physicochemical properties then th uh, those are still considered to be the similar proteins so that is the term similarity means which are not 100% same identical but they have some kind of similarity in their uh, properties physicochemical properties so um, blast can help you with that but when it comes to uh, construct a phylogenetic tree so means that you have to think that can you construct a phylogenetic tree just and give it a thought that you are having a query sequence you are giving it to the blast now what do you expect blast to do do you think will it provide you with the phylogenetic tree and one more thing that i want to add that when we say multiple sequence alignment so in that case we are providing it more than one sequence because if you want to uh, study evolution then evolution is not studied by giving a single gene it is studied it is based on the multiple comparisons so in blast you are giving it a single sequence that is that might be unknown or known so one sequence at a time whereas in msc you were giving multiple sequences and with that you were getting information regarding evolution phylogenetic trees but for blast you have to think that will you get the phylogenetic tree with the single sequence that you provide okay so are there any further doubts then you can ask because this session should be of 2 hours and i started late as well so i can give few minutes if you have questions okay so binding of the target in oligonucleotide in gene chip especially the pairing of single and double stranded double strand binding okay so uh, first of all the binding which happens so i am quite not sure about double strand binding that if uh, you provide the double stranded probe and then hybridization will happen or because for any binding you must have some exposed regions or the exposed nitrogenous bases that could bind and that could form some hydrogen bonds because if we talk about the purines and pyrimidines then they form hydrogen bonds and then only hybridization happens between the two strands of the two nucleotide strands so if we say the single strand single strand binding so what happens here is that you have the oligonucleotide that oligonucleotide contains the complementary sequences to your target means you have provided those only those oligonucleotides that will be complementary to the target when you providing your sample so the binding will only happen if the target is carrying the complementary sequences to that of the oligonucleotide so in case of the single strand those uh, so the in the nucleotides the nitrogenous bases will be exposed so now if the target will come so it will also be having the nucleotides uh, coming from it so those will bind and form the hydrogen bonds so in that way single strand will have the hybridization in that way but in double strands if you say then in double stranded you do not have anything that is exposed so for that case the binding is i think bit trivial it's bit difficult i'm not sure that how it will happen in the case of nucleotides because in nucleotides binding requires some uh, exposed nitrogenous bases due to which it can form hydrogen bonds but in certain exceptional cases i have read somewhere that triplet means triple strands are also observed but in this case in the case of gene chip i am not sure that whether the particular binding can exist because for binding there are certain factors that are necessary and if there are no region is exposed so how the binding can happen So how oligonucleotide probes are attached in the gene chip for detection? Okay, so um, firstly there are certain wells in the chips, and then these oligonucleotides they are attached to those wells. So there are different methods with which these 
these oligonucleotides they are sealed to the uh, chip there are different methods with which this sealing happens due to which this oligonucleotide probes are fixed on the gene chips and we can say that there are certain wells because these uh, oligonucleotides as we see in the figures it appears like a bigger bulky molecules that are means, coming out of these chips but this is not the case uh, you can uh, think it in terms of that you have a glass slide and you are having some blue and you are putting some drops in it so in that case what effort do you need so similarly in this oligonucleotides these are also very smaller fragments and in gene chip you have some wells in which you uh, apply those oligonucleotides and it get fixed so for fixation you can use certain things due to which these oligonucleotides remain fixed to that surface so that it do not get removed when some other competitive molecules come to bind so yeah this was the way that how these oligonucleotides are attached okay so uh, if there are no further questions then okay you can ask i can answer one last question so i hope by now you might have um, submitted your week 3 assignment but in week 3 assignments many questions were very confusing in which more than one options means appears to be true so it was very difficult in the week 3 assignment there were certain questions which i felt were like both options were like they were both were accurate so which one to select so in terms of process how single sequencing is different from ncs techniques in general terms okay so uh, ncs first of all sanger sequencing is uh, it is very um, it is dealing with this uh, smaller fragments and then for this you require that uh, what we have seen is uh, capillary electrophoresis method which is the major difference between the sanger sequencing and ncs and then in sanger sequencing you are using uh, dideoxy ntps which leads to chain termination so in this there will, will be multiple fragments that are generated and each level chain termination is happening whereas in ncs you are not you are not means generating the fragments you are not uh, terminating the process of replication but you are synthesizing the uh, complementary strands means you are doing sequences sequencing by synthesis and you are not terminating anywhere so due to which this sanger sequencing is different from ncs it is the so the at each level when you perform that sang means and when you use dd ntps they are very costly so per base cost is also quite high in case of sanger sequencing if we compare it with ncs then it is very time consuming because it is using capillary electrophoresis in the means uh, after the this binding has happened after the fragments are obtained so the capillary electrophoresis is very time consuming step which is generally not observed in the case of ngs techniques this is the major difference and then cost time all those things and then the reads that in one time you can only means in the sanger sequencing you can only uh, sequence one fragment at a time but in ngs you can sequence multiple segments at the same time that was one of the advantage high throughput sequencing so these are the major differences between the sanger and ngs and regarding your question about the uh, whether the sanger sequence whether the ngs are the modified versions of sanger sequencing so when we say modified version so with, with that we mean that if a little modification is done in the same method so that is known as the modifications but do you think the method is still the same in the ngs so that you should think about yeah this was the thing in the weekly assignment
So in those cases, you have to go with the option which appears more accurate as compared to the others. Because all options appears to be true. So the option which appears more true, that will be the right option. Okay, so now I'll end this session. Thank you so much. See you in the next session.